We had this idea of what togetherness is and intimacy that was invented in the 1950s when marriages were basically all the same. But we don't have cookie cutter marriages anymore and we shouldn't hand out cookie cutter so, advice. Marriage was an institution that was about male dominance over women. Mm -hmm. It was about acquiring property. Right. Uh, what was there to negotiate? Of course there was less overt conflict because you didn't expect anything of yeah. your marriage. Yeah. Men didn't expect good sex. Women didn't expect intimacy. They got it elsewhere. Right. And now... And that was really what was quite common. Oh, was absolutely. That they got it elsewhere. Completely common. <laughs> completely common. <laughs> I love anything that demythifies anything, and this is one of the reasons I like this book. Marrying for love has made many marriages more potentially satisfying, fulfilling, certainly fairer than ever before in history. Right. But it's also made people less willing to put up with a marriage that is not that way. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can separate them. That's a, that's a hard issue. Wow. So interesting. Lots of very interesting stuff in this book. Thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. Thanks. All right. So that's one of the reasons that we find that it's that men really, the big skill that men need to get now is how to listen. How to listen for what their wives are saying about the change they want in marriage, which is one of the best predictors mm -hmm. that a marriage will be happy, by the way. Mm -hmm. My mother's t-shirt used to say it all, if mama ain't happy, ain't, ain't nobody, nobody happy. happy. <laughs> <laughs> so true, isn't it? You, you were saying it's one of the indicators of a happy marriage. What are it's outrageous. You know, I've had too much fun writing this book to get mad back. But you let me get mad at me. No, if no, I'm I don't, don't want to get mad. But here's here's the problem. Sometimes when you get too absolutist, it backfires on you. You have this great uh, test of marital IQ, and you talk about um, this this notion of there was some a, a sort of golden standard for marriage that we imagine the 1950s had, and it really wasn't perhaps as good as we imagine it was. Well, it's interesting. I mean, there were good marriages and bad marriages in every time period, but you know, at the very end of the 1950s, they took a poll of housewives, and even the ones who were happy said, 90% of them, we don't want our daughters to do the same thing. We don't want them to get married early. We don't want them not to be able to support themselves. So there was an undercurrent in the 1950s. Of course, some marriages worked, but boy, the ones that didn't, there was no place to go because society was in massive denial about things like incest and abuse. So if you had to reduce it to one sentence, what would you say is the state of marriage in America these days? I would say better and worse, <laughs> that many of the things that have weakened marriage as an institution have in fact strengthened marriage as a relationship. When a marriage works today, it works better than any of the couples I ever studied in the past could have dreamed. But the same things that make it work make it more optional and make it less bearable when it doesn't work well. So you have this trade-off. Better marriages when they work, but more non-marriage. Well, we're looking for fairness and friendship and passion and intimacy, things that people never expected of marriage before. You know, for thousands of years, marriage was not about love at all. So I think there's a trade-off. We have these higher expectations. That makes many people work harder at their marriage, yeah. but it also makes people more disappointed when the marriage doesn't live up to it. Uh, after all, it was only 200 years ago that we invented the radical idea that young people should choose their own mates mm -hmm. and they should do so on the basis of love and what would make them happy, not their parents happy. It was only 100 years ago, in the 1920s, that we accepted the idea that there should be mutual sexual fulfillment. It was only um, 100 years ago, too, that we said that men didn't have the right to impose their will by force on their wives, mm -hmm. uh, to beat them, to imprison them, to own their property. And it's only in the last 30 years that we've decided that men and women can enter marriage as true equals. Most people don't realize this, but up until the 1970s, most states, including this one, had head and master laws or domicile uh, laws, which gave the man the right to determine where the family would live, whether his wife could take a job, all of these kinds of things. Not all men took advantage of their legal rights, but created a framework in which women were expected to do all the giving and all the, make all the effort to make a marriage work. All that's been changed. That we are having to rethink 
all the rules of marriage that were there for thousands of years. You know, all the things that we used to think we knew about who marries and what makes for good marital quality are changing. For example, in the 1950s, a man who believed in traditional gender roles, you know, I'm the breadwinner, um, he was actually more likely to be a stable husband and to have a stable marriage than a man with less conventional ideas. That's not true.